up next on Walking by Faith. When you participate with the devil, the devil believes you belong to him. Now, God gave Samson that we know of 20 years, 20 years of mercy, 20 years to repent. But because he did not conquer lust, lust controlled him and lust destroyed him. And the things you do not conquer when you're young, they control you and they destroy you when you're old. Say, so welcome to Walking by Faith. I am glad that you're with us today. You know, we're talking about Samson. We're learning lessons from this great man. Now, really the lessons that we're learning are the lessons of what not to do. You know, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that all of the things that happened in the Old Testament, they're examples to us. And they're written for our admonition on whom the ends of the world have come. Sometimes we look at what happened then and think, well, that was just then. It has nothing to do with me. But the Bible says it's an example. And it's written for your admonition. And the word literally means admonition to slap your face. In other words, when we see the mistakes that people made, we're supposed to like let it slap us and say, wow, I need to straighten up. And with Samson, it's a shame, but the lessons we learn are what not to do. He was a loner. He was never with anybody. One of the things we need to learn is we need to have strong relationships. Samson did not deal with sin in his life. And as he grew older, that sin came to dominate him and ultimately even destroy him. Uh, I want you to come with us right now as we go and look at some of the lessons that apply to you and me today from Samson's life. Well, today we're going to be talking more about lessons from Samson. Now, when you, when, when you go to seminary or, or you attend a Bible college, one of the classes that you will take is hermeneutics. And you say, well, I don't know why they call it hermeneutics. Why don't they just say what it is? All right. But hermeneutics is how to interpret the Bible. One of the first principles that you learn in hermeneutics is the principle of first mention, which simply states that the first time anything is mentioned in the Bible, the predominant truths about that thing that'll be true in life and true throughout the entire word of God are put forth the first time any subject is mentioned. So in Judges 14, we're going to begin to read with verse 12, and we find Samson. He's at his wedding celebration. And as you remember, Samson is a loner. He has no friends. So they find 30 men to be Samson's friends. And then he said to those 30 men, he said, let me pose a riddle to you. And if you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot explain it to me, then I will give, excuse me, then you will give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. Now, they pass, they're, they're trying to figure out the riddle. They can't. They go to his wife and they say, find out what this riddle is. Because uh, if you don't, we're going to have to pay. And if we have to pay, we're going to kill you and we're going to kill your family. And so she finds out what the riddle is. He doesn't want to tell her, but finally he tells her. And it says in verse 18, so the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what's sweeter than honey, what's stronger than a lion, which is the answer to the riddle. And he said, well, if you hadn't plowed with my heifer, he said, you would not have solved my riddle. And then he goes down to Eklon, and the Bible says he kills 30 men of the Philistines, and he takes their apparel, and he gives their clo those clothes to the people that had answered the riddle. He's angry. He goes home. And then the Bible says, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best friend. And this is the first mention of gambling anywhere in the Bible. And so we're going to take and just apply a few principles from the principle of first mention here and look at the truths that we can find about gambling in 
this little passage. Well, the first thing you'll notice is that he bet more than he could lose. He was opportunistic. He he thought, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. And he bet more than he could lose. It caused him to have secrecy in his marriage. A lot of times when people are gambling, they don't want their spouse to find out. He committed a crime to pay his gambling debts. In fact, he murdered 30 men. Uh, You'll notice the result of his gambling was he lost his marriage. Uh, When he lost, he, he, he was angry. He wanted vengeance. It's very often when people lose in gambling that they think, you know, I, I, want to, I want vengeance. I want to get it back. The second mention, by the way, of gambling in your Bible is found in the New Testament, and it's at the cross. Jesus is on the cross, and they're casting lots. They're gambling to find out who's going to receive his garment. He had a very expensive piece of cloth or clothing made of just one well, one piece, there were, there were no hymns on it, uh, and they were gambling for it. Now, anything that happened on the cross is important. Jesus was humiliated on the cross as they gambled for his clothes. You know, one of the, one of the most humiliating things that can happen to you, whether you realize it or not, is for you to lose by chance what you gain by honest labor. Now, I just thought I would give you an example. I've used this one before, but, but I just don't know of a better one. Uh, we're going we're gonna to let Bill Gates play the Michigan Lotto. All right? Now, we, we contacted the Michigan Lotto, and they said that there is on Michigan Lotto a 55.4% payout on the Michigan Lotto. So... There is a 44.6% loss every time that a person plays. That, that's your odds of losing the Michigan Lotto. You will lose 44.6% of your wealth. So we, uh, we found out, we, we, we put this together August the 30th, last month. And uh, on August the 30th, Bill Gates, it was, uh, his, his wealth was down to $56 billion second richest man in the world, poor guy. So he's going to begin playing, and he plays August the 31st with 56 million, and he wins. Of course he wins because he puts all his money in. He wins 55.4% of it back, but he loses 44.6%, and so the first day he lost 25 billion. But he, he, he believes he can win, so he's back at it the next day with his $31 billion that he has left, and he loses $14 billion. You say, how did he do that? Well, there's a 44.6% loss, and that's what he lost, $14 billion. He plays again this September the 2nd. He loses $8 billion, so now he's down. His wealth is $9.5 billion. He keeps playing on the 6th of September. He lost again. And now he's down to 896 million. He keeps playing. And by the 10th of September, he keeps on losing 44.6% every day. And he's down to 84 million. He keeps playing. And on the 15th of September, he's down to 4,400,000. But he keeps playing. And by the 20th of September, his total net worth is down to 200 and 30,000. He keeps playing, and by the 25th, his total net worth is $12,007. And he keeps playing, and on the 28th, his net worth is $2,042. And he keeps playing on the 31st day, September the 30th, his total net worth is $627. Listen, If it won't work for Bill Gates, it won't work for you. If it won't work for him, it's not going to work for you. You need to decide to take a position that you're not going to gamble. Gambling essentially is the redistribution of wealth according to chance 
and not according to what one contributes to society. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 20. It says this, the man who wants to do right will get a rich reward, but the man who wants to get rich quick will quickly fail. The King James says, will not be innocent. Gambling really is against, flows against the biblical work ethic. The biblical work ethic says the hand of the diligent will prosper. The hand of the diligent will prosper. The other thing that gambling is a violation of, it is a violation of your stewardship to God. Do you realize that everything that you own belongs to God, not 10%? Everything. And literally every time we spend money, we should be asking, is this what God would want me to do with this money? Is this what God would want me to do? Because we're stewards, we're not owners. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. God does not want you to get involved in a get-quick-rich scheme gambling, right? And again, Jesus on the cross, he said about that time, he said, this is the hour of the powers of darkness. This is the hour of the powers of darkness. And is it any wonder that at the foot of his cross, at the hour of the power of darkness, they are gambling over what he has? It is the ultimate humiliation to lose by chance what you gained by hard, honest labor. Here's a few statistics. 65% of pathological liars commit crimes to support their gambling habits. In a survey of Gamblers Anonymous, 28% reported either being separated or divorced as a result of their gambling problems. Samson, as a result of his gambling problem, lost his marriage. The divorce rate for problem gamblers is twice that of non-gamblers. One in five addictive gamblers attempt suicide. The suicide rate is 20 times higher than that of non-gamblers. 44% of addictive gamblers admit to having stolen at work to pay their gambling debts. And the suicide rate for spouses of compulsive gamblers is 15,000% the national average. Right? Somebody said, well, there's no difference between investing in the stock market and gambling. Well, you see, when you invest in the stock market, you're buying a piece of a, of a company that produces a good or services. But when you gamble, it's just redistribution of wealth by chance. And it's a violation of, the, of biblical principles. Second lesson we're going to look at today is I'm just going to call this the Gaza lesson. And this one is one we need to pay very careful attention to. It says, now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. And when the Gazaites were told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. And they were quiet all night saying in the morning, when it's daylight, we'll kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gates of the city and the two gate posts and pulled them up, bars and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, I want you to get an idea of the scope of what happens here. He goes over to the gates of the city, right? Now, these gates are what are supposed to keep out the enemy. These gates are made of bronze or brass or some metal. And he pulls out the post. That is the equivalent of pulling out two telephone poles. And then he takes the gates and the posts and he gets them on his back. And the Bible says he walks to the mount that faces Hebron. I, I looked yesterday. It's an 18 mile walk. Now this is the equivalent of taking two telephone poles in a semi trailer and putting them on your back and walking with them. Now I want to ask you a question. Was what Samson did supernatural? Did God enable him to do it? Yes. 
Next question. Was God pleased with his life? No. The answer is no. Here's what happens in people's lives. People think, because, well, I prayed and God answered my prayer. Or I was praying and I felt God's love. I felt his presence. Uh, I was ministering to somebody and God used me to minister to them. Because you're worshiping, again, and you, and you sense the presence and the moving of the Holy Spirit. Here's the temptation. To think that because God blesses you, or because God uses you, or because you sense God's presence, you think, I'm okay with God. My life pleases God simply because God uses you, or because God answers your prayer, or because you feel his presence. David had a similar thing happen. You know how David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he sent her husband, Uriah, into a battle and said, retreat and make sure that he dies. And he was killed. During this time, he's fighting a battle against the Ammonites and he wins the battle. He wins the war. And then he takes Bathsheba to be his wife. And everything in David's life looks good. But this is what the Bible says. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And there is a real tendency among people to think, because God answers my prayers, because I feel God's presence when I worship, because God uses me, that what I'm doing must be right. It must be okay. God understands that I have this little problem. God understands that, that I just need this. I, I'm a special case. I had one guy tell me, he said, I have a special dispensation from God to do this. Right? Now, the truth is, the thing that you're doing displeases the Lord. In Psalms 50, it says this in verse 17. Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented with him. And you've been partakers with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother and slander your own mother's son. The, look at these things you have done and I kept silent and you thought I was altogether like you. See, so often when God continues to bless, when God continues to answer prayer, when God continues to touch your life and you feel God's presence, you think God understands. God's just letting me do this. And God says, because I was silent, he says, you thought I was altogether like you. You thought that it was all right. But listen, this is what God says. But I will rebuke you and I will set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God. Least I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver you. Do not think that because God is merciful, that God approves of sin in your life. And just says, it's all right, just keep going. Just keep going the way that you're going. Samson thought that. But God was being merciful to Samson and giving Samson opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. And God does the same with us. He gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. It says this in Corinthians. He says, because you don't judge yourself, he says, you'll be judged. So God judges you because you don't judge yourself. All right, next lesson. Oh, this is a powerful one. All right, what you do not conquer when you're young, controls and often destroys you when you're old. Now, we, we looked at Samson the first week, and he goes down to Timnath, and he sees a woman, an ungodly Philistine woman, and says, I want to marry her. She looks good. How many realize he's got a problem with his eyes? Ten years later, we find him in Gaza, and he's with a prostitute. Now, another ten years have passed. And now he's in the valley of Sorek. 
And it says in Judges 16, 4, afterwards it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came to her and said, entice him and find out where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where, is your, where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if you bind me with seven fresh bro strings, not dried, then I shall become weak and become like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches the fire. So the street secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. Now, first time he tells her bowstrings, next time he tells her new ropes, next time he tells her, put my hair in a loom. And every time he tells her something in the morning, that is his condition. Now, listen, you do not need to be a rocket scientist <laughs> to figure this out. This woman does not really love you. All right. But finally... The fourth time, he tells her, if you cut my hair, he said, I'll be as weak as any man. I've been a Nazarite to God since my birth, and my hair has never been cut. And, of course, you know what happens. They cut his hair. They capture him. They pluck out his eyes, and they make him work as a slave, literally doing the work of an ox. Now, listen to Ecclesiastes 8 and 8. And wickedness will not deliver or release those who are given to it. You know, people participate in sin and they think, I'm just going to do this for a while. <laughs> I'm just going to do this for a while. I just want to know what it's like. And they think I'm just going to do this and then I'm going to walk away. But the problem is that wickedness will not deliver. It will not release those who give themselves to it. Proverbs 5, in his own, his own iniquity entraps the wicked man. He's caught in the cords of his sin. In other words, sin has cords or tentacles. And you participate in sin. You make the choice. But what happens is sin puts out its tentacles, its cords, and it grabs you. And you become addicted. It becomes a part of your lifestyle. And when you want to walk away and are free, you find that you're bound. Proverbs 11, 5, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through dry places. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I've gone out. Now listen, when you participate with the devil, the devil believes you belong to him. He believes you belong to him. Note what that demon said, I will return to my house. When he says my house, he's talking about your body. When you participate with the devil, the devil believes you belong to him. Now, God gave Samson that we know of 20 years, 20 years of mercy, 20 years to repent. But because he did not conquer lust, lust controlled him and lust destroyed him. And the things you do not conquer when you're young, they control you and they destroy you when you're old. Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. No matter how long it's been, no matter what it is, when you confess and you forsake, God has mercy for you. The blood of Jesus did more than just forgive you. The blood of Jesus gave you the power to dominate sin so that sin will not rule over you. Now, we've been talking about Samson. What's interesting is at the end of Samson's life, Samson comes back to God. And I don't know where you are today. 
Maybe you're away from the Lord. Maybe you've never given your life to God or maybe you're serving Him. But if you're away from God and you say, I want to get back to God, I want to get right with God, I want to invite you right now to pray this prayer from your heart. Repeat this out loud. Just say, Oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that His blood paid for my sins, that He rose again, that He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. Right now, I give Him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm going to live for Jesus every day. I thank you that you've heard my prayer, that I'm forgiven, that I'm your child, a part of your eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed that from your heart, God heard that prayer, and you are right with God. And I'd like you to contact us. I wrote a book, and I want to send you a free copy. This book is full of bullet points to show you how to keep on growing, how to keep on pleasing God with your life. All you need to do is contact us. All the information is right there on your screen. Now, if the broadcast is being a blessing to you, if this broadcast is feeding you spiritually, would you please send a financial gift? Help us take the same message that you've just heard to people around the world in 170 different nations. Thank you, and God bless you. At Walking by Faith, we have prayer partners standing by just waiting to pray with you. So if you just prayed with Pastor Dwayne, don't waste a moment. Please give us a call. I know many of you that watch this program have been waiting for a good time to sow a financial seed into this ministry. Right now is the time. Right now, your gift will make twice the difference. An anonymous donor has offered to match dollar for dollar every gift that you give to Walking by Faith up to $100,000 between now and December the 31st. This means that if you send a gift of $25 today, really it doubles and it becomes 50. Or if you send 500, it doubles and becomes 1,000. Whatever you're able to give, we will use to take the gospel to 170 nations around the world, winning souls and transforming lives. Won't you take a moment right now and pick up your phone and call or get online. All the information that you need is right there on your screen. Remember, your gift will make twice the difference touching lives through walking by faith all around the world. Thank you, and God bless you. If you would like to purchase today's teaching, we have it available on DVD for $8 and CD for $6. What you do not conquer when you're young controls and often destroys you when you're old to order, just call or visit walkingbyfaith.tv. Thank you for watching Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith is made possible in part by the generous gifts of our viewers. If you would like to contribute to reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through this program, please contact us at Walking by Faith, 5120 Ivan Rest Avenue Southwest. Granville, Michigan, 49418.